All right, this is the final part of this lecture. Uh, the majority of it is going to focus on DNA repair mechanisms, um, but at the end of this lecture I have included a link for a YouTube video that will just give you some imagery on the idea of transposable elements. I ask that you read the section on transposable elements in your textbook and that you review aspects of the Mastering Genetics homework that pertain to transposons for the final exam. DNA repair systems are an essential aspect of cellular life because as I described in the previous portion of this lecture, there are many mutagenic agents that exist naturally in nature and also that exist in greater abundance due to human activities. So the DNA repair mechanisms are in fact a collection of processes by which cells identify and repair DNA damage. There are some common principles to these systems that it's imp important or useful to focus on as you're learning about them. One is that most DNA repair systems, and I said most here, require an undamaged strand to serve as a template during repair of the complementary damaged strand. And the second is the idea of redundancy. And that's the idea that there are, in fact, many repair systems. And so much of the kinds of DNA that commonly occur, DNA damage that can commonly occur in nature, can be repaired by more than one system. So we have backup, in other words, which is good because it's really essential to keep our DNA as error-free as possible. We're going to talk about the DNA repair systems listing, listed here. Proofreading and mismatch repair, photoreactivation repair, post-replication repair in the SOS system, base and nucleotide excision repair, and double-strand break repair. DNA proofreading is something that I've mentioned before. It's a function of many of the DNA polymerase enzymes that exist in nature. There is about, or there are about 1 in about 10 to the 7, or 10 million to 1 in about 10 to the minus 11 incorrect insertions of nucleotides per generation or per round of DNA synthesis, despite an error frequency of 1 in 10 to the 5. So in other words, as the, as the DNA synthesis machinery is operating, it makes a repair about 1 in every 10,000 nucleotides, but that gets corrected because after synthesis is done, when we go back and we look at the DNA, we have fewer than 1 in 10 million errors. So that shows that we actually have really good proofreading function in most of our DNA polymerase systems. That proofreading is a result of what is called 3' prime to 5' prime exonuclease function. Exonuclease is to remove DNA from the ends of an, of an area. And that exonuclease function allows us to excise or remove and the incorrect nucleotides and then replace them with correct ones. It is the epsilon subunit of DNA polymerase 3 in E. coli that executes proofreading. If something happens and there's an error in that gene so that you get you know, poorly functioning epsilon subunit, then you see a much higher rate of DNA error. So this cartoon is showing what I mean by that. We've got a DNA strand and it is being synthesized. The template strands are shown in blue. The new DNA being synthesized is shown in red. We're really only seeing synthesis on, on the leading strand here. The pink donutty guy is DNA polymerase. And the yellow here is indicating that an incorrect nucleotide has been added. So some sort of error in base pairing occurred. That error results in a distortion in the double helix, which is not really shown in this figure, but I want you to imagine the DNA polymerase as a result of the activity of the epsilon subunit is able to back up and it has removed this incorrect nucleotide and then a new correct nucleotide shown here has been inserted. So all of this re re resolves or, or relies upon the ability of the DNA polymerase to reverse direction and remove nucleotides on the new strand. This is a 3 to 5 prime exonuclease activity and then resynthesis in the 5 to 3 prime direction, of course. So one of the questions is um, that's been well studied is the, is the question, well, how does the DNA polymerase know which strand of DNA has the error in it? 
because the DNA polymerase typically detects that error has occurred by detecting a distortion in the DNA strand. So when it backs up and it removes the nucleotide, why would it remove the nucleotide from the new strand and not the template strand? And the answer to that, at least in E. coli, is the existence of something called methyl-directed mismatch repair. So in methyl-directed mismatch repair, we have enzyme systems that rely on the protein synthesized when E. coli expresses genes called mute S, mute L, and mute H. Those genes get expressed, and they make a set of proteins, and those proteins are able to detect methylation. So the DNA polymerase will detect a distortion, and then it will back up, and it will look at the area of distortion, and it will determine in that area of distortion which strand has methyl groups on it and which one doesn't. The template strand will be methylated. Okay, So the template is the older strand and it has methylation on its nucleotides. The brand new strand hasn't had time to be methylated yet and so it will lack methyl groups. Because it lacks methyl groups, the enzymes that are produced when we express or when E. coli expresses those genes will remove um, the unmethylated nucleotide and then replace um, that, the nucleotide, that removed nucleotide or that excised nucleotide with the new and hopefully correct nucleotide. So the way that E. coli knows which nucleotide to remove is that it detects the region based on distortion in the double helix, and then it chooses the specific nucleotide or nucleotides based on the lack of methylation, which tells it which is the new strand that likely has the errors. All right, so in the previous lecture, I talked about how UV light can cause um, dimerization of thymine, resulting in, here it's called a photodimine, or photodimer, in the previous lecture, I called that a thymine dimer. And it's the result of covalent bonding between two thymine nucleotide bases um, induced by UV light. So this is a mutation event here. Now, luckily for us, in the presence of UV light, which contains a great level of white light within it as well, typically, we also will produce an enzyme called photolyase. And the photolyase's job is to repair thymine dimers. So the light energy both induces mutation and it turns on the production of an enzyme system that will repair that mutation. We've evolved to protect ourselves from thymine dimers over time, over many, many uh, thousands of years of evolutionary history. The name of this replication system, which is post-replication repair, is a little bit confusing. Post-replication repair um, is called post-replication repair because it's not part of the normal proofreading functions. It happens like a moment later, but still during DNA replication. So it's after damaged DNA has escaped repair by proofreading. And it has failed, you know, and, and proofreading has failed to fully correct it or has failed to correct it at all, but synthesis is still occurring, okay? I.e., synthesis is still happening. All right, so let's take a look at the top part of this figure. Here we've got thymine thymine lesion. So this could be a thymine dimer, for example, that has not been corrected by photolyase yet, hasn't been corrected by proofreading. We've got an error. It's a lesion or an error. And the pink is showing the template strands, right? And the gray is showing the new DNA that is being synthesized complementary to the template. So everything is fine down here. It's up here that we have a problem. So everything's good here. Up here we have an error. So what will happen is um, and we've got the leading strand on the bottom, we've got the lagging strand at the top in this figure. So what's happening on the top is replication is doing the best that it can 
and it's skipping over the lesion and continuing. So we've got this little hole here. That's a problem. So what happens in the post-replication repair system, which relies on the RecA protein, specifically in E. coli, it's called RAD51, is it is going to kick in a process that's a type of recombinational exchange. And the exchange is going to happen with this. Okay, the, This undamaged area of the template strand on the opposite side of the replication fork is actually going to be swapped in to fill in that gap. Okay, So now it's here. And that left behind a gap on that template strand, but the replication uh, machinery has a, a way of dealing with that. So DNA polymerase 1 okay, is going to fill, fill in that hole and ligase is going to seal up the phosphodiester linkages here and here, just the way that it would on any Okazaki fragment. And that is the post-replication repair system. SOS repair, um, as the name implies, is an emergency, heavy-duty, the ship is sinking type of repair system. It is a repair system that relies on about, in E. coli at least, about 20 different genes, including genes called LexA, RecA, and UVR in E. coli and other bacteria. Um, that repair system is turned on when there are many, many DNA lesions or much damage, a lot of mismatching, a lot of gaps, a lot of distortion and holes in the double helix of a, of a bacterial chromosome. And it's a system that will force replication to occur even if there is damage within the DNA. It also is a system that coordinates with something called nucleotide excision repair and other repair systems. So in the presence of acute DNA damage, the RecA protein is turned on, it is activated, which is what this little star is meaning, and then the activated RecA is going to turn on, um, it's going to signal a protein called LexA, which is going to turn on these genes shown on the bottom so that we make all of these proteins so that we can do SOS repair. It's a system that's been very well studied in bacterial systems. It also um, does occur in eukaryotes, although it's a little bit less understood. Um, and, it, and it is uh, very useful in the face of acute DNA damage, for example, the kind of DNA damage that would occur after a pretty severe um, nuclear explosion or, and, or nuclear incident um, had damaged organismal DNA. All right, a little bit um, sort of less severe, but the idea of what's called base excision repair. So in base excision repair, we, we rely on enzymes called DNA glycosylases and um, AP endonucleases. Here we have a damaged base. Okay, a single lesion, and what will happen is a DNA glycosylase will remove the base from that particular area, leaving a headless nucleotide. That is then discovered as the active site for an AP endonuclease, which will come in and it will remove a section of DNA in that area, and that section of DNA is then just seen by DNA polymerase 1 and DNA ligase as a fragment where synthesis and phosphodiester bonding needs to occur and they will come in and they will fill that gap. So in this system they are using these nucleotides as the template. So you should get an error-free result at the end of this process. This is a system that is triggered by relatively small distortions in the, in the double helix. If it's a larger lesion, a system called nucleotide excision repair will instead be called in or will additionally be called in. And this is the nucleotide excision repair system. So in the case of a larger, uh, larger lesion, where you have more than one damaged nucleotide as shown in the top of this figure, and this could occur as a result of UV damage, or whenever you have um, bulky adducts. Remember, adducts are when we have mutagenic chemicals that are covalently bonded onto the bases of nucleotides. So you get some kind of you know, pretty significant distortion in the double helix, indicating that there's a fairly large error. 
What will happen then is the gene products from the UVR A, B, and C gene will be um, called in, and they're under SOS control, but they're also a separate, they're also involved in nucleotide excision repair as a separate standalone system. They will form this large protein complex, and they will come in and they will remove the damaged DNA, and they will, that hole will then be filled in by DNA polymerase 1 and DNA ligase. Mammals use the same system, and it's a system that can be invoked by large lesions, but also by double-stranded breaks. And um, in mammals, such as ourselves, the BRCA1 and 2 proteins play a role in this type of nucleotide excision repul. And they are proteins that are involved in breast cancer. So when those proteins don't work properly, you're more prone to certain forms of breast cancer. A really interesting but rare condition called xeroderma pigmentosum. It's a genetic disease, and the symptoms of this disease and the results of it are extraordinary sensitivity to sunlight. So if you have xeroderma pigmentosum, you have a defective nucleotide excision repair system, and you have to avoid the sun with great, great diligence because you are, if you're exposed to any UV energy at all, you are very, very likely to develop mutation in the cells of your skin, and you are predisposed to all sorts of skin abnormalities and to cancers in the skin, and um, this condition is also associated with a variety of developmental and neurological defects. So it's a very, very serious condition to have, um, and, the, and the best treatment that we have for it right now is making sure that people with this condition are never exposed to, to UV energy of any kind. The worst kind of damage that you can have in your DNA is to have a double-stranded break. And double-stranded breaks can be caused by radiation, particularly ionizing radiation, and they can also be caused by oxidative stress if it is extreme. Um, they are particularly challenging for cells because there is no convenient template strand utilized that can be utilized for repair synthesis and that that makes challenging that makes repair of double stranded breaks very very challenging there are two in eukaryotes there are two primary systems for fixing this they're called homologous recombination repair and non-homologous end joining repair both will repair double stranded breaks but often the dna is quite different after repair than it was before so what the implications of that are is, is hard to say, but it's often serious. All right, let's look at homologous recombination repair. So up at the top of this figure, we have two strands of DNA. So the red and the blue would be the homologs, like the pair of chromosomes that, that, that you have or that an organism, a eukaryotic organism has. The red strand is broken. That's what's happening in step one. So we've had a double-stranded break. And what will happen first is that that break will be detected by the homologous recombination repair system and um, the five prime ends at the breakpoints will be degraded leaving three prime overhangs. There's a three prime overhang right there. Here's another three prime overhang right there. Then what will happen is the protein called RecA, which does an awful lot of things involved with um, DNA repair, but also is a really key protein during um, the recombination events that happen routinely during um, prophase 1 of meiosis. Um, we've discussed that plenty in class earlier. Anyway, the RecA protein will facilitate something that's called strand invasion of the homolog. So notice what's happening here. There was nothing wrong with the blue piece, right? It was the red piece that was damaged. And so the blue piece is participating in what's called strand in invasion, and that's facilitated by the RecA facilities. What will happen then is you can observe something called a D-loop structure and also structures called holiday junctures, which we looked at a couple weeks ago in class and are well described in your textbook. The holiday structures are shown here, holiday junctures, and they're able to travel with the help of proteins. Um, and ultimately, they will resolve or separate using a protein called resolvase, and that means that they will come apart and we will have two intact chromosomes, one that's been spliced together, <coughs> one that's thought of as being um, patched. <coughs> now, I said this was all facilitated by Rec A, but Rec A is actually called 
excuse me, rad 51 in, in eukaryotes. If you want to look at a, an animation of this occurring, this YouTube link, YouTube link has a pretty good video of this process. But this is the system called homologous recombination repair. It relies on the same proteins that play a role during routine DNA recombination that occurs in meiosis. And the cell is getting around the lack of a proper template strand to fix this break up here by using the homologous chromosome as a template for synthesis, for repair synthesis. In addition to that system, when there is a double-stranded break in a eukaryotic organism, there's a process known as non-homologous end-joining that can occur. So here we have a double-stranded break, that's what I mean by DS break, and it's been detected by proteins that are called Ku proteins. Ku70 and 80 complex together are shown here. The Ku proteins interact with another set of proteins called the DNA PKC proteins, and they are going to attach to the broken ends. Once they attach to the broken ends, ligase and supplemental proteins will come along and they will form phosphodiester linkages which will restore DNA integrity. So at the end of the day, we have, we have a fixed or a, or a resolved break. The break has been resolved or corrected. Now sometimes as this happens, nucleotides are lost. And also I want you to envision a situation where there's been really widespread DNA damage, which is what it takes to get a double-stranded break. The non-homologous end joining is going to put together um, ends, but it may actually not put together the correct ends. So you may, this, this is the kind of system that can result in one piece, a piece of a, one chromosome being moved over and attached to another chromosome. These can be uh, lethal to the organism, but they can also result in the formation of new chromosomes or the loss of previous chromosomes, which are some of the events that have to occur in order to have new species form. All right, now to, to finish this lecture, I would like you to view the video um, that is linked here. Um, you may have to retype that. I'm not sure if this will show up live within the context of this YouTube video. And that'll give you some imagery on transposon movement. It's, it really focuses on transposons within bacterial systems, but that's okay. Um, and I'd also like you to be sure to review all aspects of the Mastering Genetics homework that I provided you with, that I asked you to do a couple weeks back, on the topic of mutation, addressing that chapter in your textbook. And know that you are accountable for that homework on the final exam. I'll see you all in class.